Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Trevor Hughes, and I'm the president and CEO of the IAPP, the International Association of Privacy Professionals. We are the world's largest privacy organization. We represent all of the people in the world who work in data protection and privacy. And I'm delighted to be here at RSA this year, joined by an esteemed panel to talk about four little letters. Four little letters that have been causing us so much trouble, so much work, and of course those are GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. The regulation passed uh, just some years ago, uh, but went into effect on May 25th of this year, just over two months ago, and it has created an enormous amount of work for organizations around the world. What we thought we would do for you today is create a panel of experts representing views from around the world on the effect of GDPR, what it means to organizations today, and what we might expect in the future. Let me give you just a little bit of background on how we got to where we are now, and then we'll dive into things with our panelists. So first of all, the GDPR is a replacement. It is a regulation that replaces a directive in Europe in 1995. The European Union passed the Data Protection Directive, which was the law of Europe with regards to data protection for over 20 years. However, given that that law was passed in 1995 and as a result did not reflect the internet or smartphones, the rise of social media, many of the technologies that we take for granted today, there was a recognition that a new standard, a new set of policies needed to be created and so the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, um, it was drafted early, about seven, eight years ago, and uh, passed just four or five years ago with an expectation of May 25th being the compliance deadline. So now we are in the GDPR era, and it is a monumental moment for data protection. One of the things that we are seeing around the world is tremendous investment and growth in privacy and data protection. I can give you a sense of that from the IEPP itself. Um, we have 42,000 members around the world in over 100 countries. But just 24 months ago, we had 20,000 members around the world. So the size of the IEPP, if that is any indicator of how GDPR has affected um, our world, uh, I think our growth is a great indicator of that. Okay, welcome to you all. Um, I am going to play a little game as we go through the panel today. And the little game is I'm going to read a quote and you get to guess who it is. So our first quote is, there are no grace periods because the grace period was already two years ago. Who said that? I'm gonna guess it was Helen Dixon. Wrong. Any other guesses? Is it Vera Yarova? Another good guess, but also wrong. Uh, it's Andrea Jelinek. Andrea Jelinek is the Austrian Data Protection Commissioner. And um, Andrea was talking, of course, about the GDPR. She is notably now the chair of the European Data Protection Board. And um, let's use that quote as a way to talk about how prepared we are. So um, who would like to start? Where are we in terms of our preparations for GDPR? And in many ways, are we too late if we're still preparing for GDPR? So Trevor, I'll start with that question. Um, one of the things that we've seen in helping companies around the world in their preparation for GDPR is that a lot of work has been put in, but only 20% of companies that we surveyed recently have actually claimed to be GDPR compliant. Um, many more are actually in the process of implementation, but have a number of other things that they're still trying to complete. Um, in fact, there are I think if I recall correctly, about 30% or so that have not even begun to prepare. And so there are many, many organizations that still have a lot of work to do 
but we do know that many organizations have put a tremendous amount of effort into place already to begin to understand what's happening with their data in a way that they had not necessarily ever done before. They're doing inventories. They're beginning to do much more stringent assessments and things of that nature. Therishni, you're with a global multinational. Describe how the global focus on GDPR has affected Aon. Is it, a, is it a big project? How many people around the world? How senior was the engagement for, for GDPR? So as a global organization, I think the focus on GDPR just really put a spotlight on how important data was to the company. Um, we've always marketed ourselves as a data-driven entity, just being in risk and reinsurance. Um, and so in terms of involvement, we had involvement all the way up from the CEO level and the board level. Um, and that really increased um, the amount of, I guess, expenditure that we had in order to be in compliance. So that, that was a lucky thing that we had. But in terms of focus towards not just Europe, I think understanding that there were data flows not just originating from Europe, but also coming from other parts of the world into Europe, and those are important areas, has been really good from a privacy professional um, perspective, because you do get to understand your business better, but also to understand where your data is located, where, how your data is being used, and what kind of people are we actually interacting with when we are collecting this kind of data. So, traditionally, let me stay with you just for one second, because I think it's important to note that the GDPR is a European regulation but the effect of GDPR is very much global, and that's because GDPR has what we call extraterritorial application. So if you are an organization around the world that, that interacts with a data subject, with a person in Europe, you are theoretically subject to GDPR, is that right? Absolutely, and I think the GDPR makes a reference that if you are transacting with an EU resident, that just makes you, um, you have to comply with the obligations of the GDPR. And I think there's a bit of a lack of understanding with when does the GDPR apply outside of the EU. I think a lot of companies out here say, that's a European legislation. You know, we have other laws here, we don't need to comply with that. But ultimately, you know, when you have a 4% global turnover being the sanction, that's really when organizations really need to kind of realize, hey, we need to look at this European piece of legislation that we've never really kind of paid attention to much before. So we'll talk about enforcement in a second, but 4% of global turnover is fines. That creates, I think, some attention uh, from senior execs. Alex, tell us a little bit um, from the perspective of Accenture, what do you see the readiness as around the world? Accenture clearly is a very global organization. Are there differences between multinational corporations and small and medium-sized businesses? Um, is, are there regions of the world that are more focused on GDPR right now? What is the perspective that you see? Yeah. Um, so, very clearly, from an European perspective specifically, um, I think there is a great advancement currently with many companies on the readiness. So I see, especially in Europe, um, everybody is prepared on GDPR in a kind of way. And that doesn't mean that they are 100% done with it, especially for the SME companies, so the medium and small sized companies. But um, if I'm going to the doctor, even my carnival club, all, all those kind of associations, small companies, even the bakeries, if needed, they are kind of coming up with notifications and consent and whatever. So it's truly like that. Um, are they ready in other aspects of GDPR readiness? I'm not sure about this, but you definitely see a much greater sense of understanding and awareness what it means to handle personal data. Um, for us at Accenture, um, obviously GDPR was a big advantage also to push it as an enhancer for our data privacy and also for our information security system. Um, into the company and push it through because we are in more than 40, 45 com countries, so we really need to make sure that we have a global baseline, so we leverage GDPR for that. Um, are we ready? Um, yes, we are. Uh, we have implemented what we had to implement. Is this perfect? Um, I don't think so. Um, I think we are now in what we call phase two, 
um, make further improvements to what you have implemented in the processes, and also learn actually how it really works, because um, in the beginning it was all on paper and it was all in theory, but now we are learning um, in the daily doing what we can do better and how to improve. Excellent. So I, I, I find it really compelling that for a large organization like Accenture, you're using GDPR as a global baseline. Yes. So that that is sort of the expectation, and then I presume you do variation by jurisdiction if there is law that changes yeah. beyond GDPR. Yeah, I think we are seeing an interesting effect with GDPR, and that is that not only does it have extraterritorial application, so you may not be a European organization, but you may be subject to GDPR, but also many organizations like Accenture are using GDPR as their baseline for managing data protection, managing privacy around the world. And one of the things that's driving that is the need under GDPR for you to have in agreements in place with all of the companies with which you transact data. Um, data processor agreements, DPAs, they're becoming a well-known thing. Hillary, maybe you could talk a little bit about this. So some organizations which may not ever have a customer in Europe may actually receive one of these data processor agreements because of a customer or a partner or a vendor that they work with. Is that right? That's absolutely right. So one of the things that's required under GDPR is if you are a controller of data, controller is the one who makes the company that makes the decisions about the data, your obligation when you're engaging any third party, regardless of where they are in the supply, chain is to make sure that they and those connected with them in that supply chain are entering into these new agreements that Trevor's mentioning. So a data processor agreement or a data processing addendum known by this new acronym DPA is something that everyone who's engaging third-party suppliers, vendors, is going to need to make sure is put in place. And it's very different from the kinds of agreements that we've seen before. They're very specific obligations with respect to things like notification of security breaches, managing individual rights, cooperating with a data controller, making sure that adequate protections are being put in place, and then binding anybody else that's actually working together with you, sub-processors, hosting providers, others that help to provide the service together has to enter into an agreement as well. And what we're seeing as a result is that this is taking up a tremendous amount of time for organizations to negotiate and it does need to be coupled with some really good due diligence about whether the organizations that you're engaging, the vendors you're engaging, are in fact those that can meet these requirements because of the, as we were talking about already, um, Thirishnu was saying the 4% fine that one can have if you're not meeting these requirements effectively. We're going to get to the 4% fines, okay. I promise. <laughs> uh, so it is interesting, though, that whether you are directly subject to GDPR because you're based in Europe or through extraterritorial application, you're subject to GDPR because you're based outside of Europe, but you have European customers. There is a long shadow to GDPR, which is that many global organizations are using it as their baseline, and many other organizations are sending out these data processor agreements, which essentially bake in GDPR protections through contract to your organization. I, I think the big message that we're trying to convey with the panel here is that whether you think you are subject to GDPR or not, you are likely to uh, struggle with some of the effects of GDPR, and you probably should be ready. All right, another quote. Ready? Here we go. You need to ensure that compliance is not focused on the legal department, but throughout the company. Who said that? I, I know these are all going to be tough. It's <laughs> Isabelle Salk Perrotin, um, and Isabelle is the commissioner of the CNIL, the French Data Protection Regulator. And I think she's saying something very important. Uh, she's saying that GDPR is not a policy driven right. um, regulation. GDPR is actually a new way of doing business, that you have to drive it across the company. So, Tharishni, why don't you help us out? Tell us what has been the most vexing implementation challenge for, f under GDPR for Aon? Sure. Um, I think I kind of initially spoke a little bit about it, which is understanding where your data is and really 
how much data do you collect, where is it being stored, how is it being used in an organization. I think one of the things that we immediately see is that, well, you collect data at this point, what happens behind the scenes mm. is something that a lot of legal professionals have never really taken into account before. I think this is when you see the relationship between infosec professionals um, you know, coming through with the legal department, but also with board level management. Because initially it was, well, we don't really care where our data is. As long as we have it and we do whatever we want to maximize profits. But now I think with the GDPR, it says you have to know where your data is. And that relates to the fact that, one, if anything goes wrong, i.e. a data breach, that will be a problem. But two, if an individual makes a request either to delete their data or access their data to, under, to, to have data portability, i.e. transfer it from one organization to another, all of that comes down to knowing where your data is. And that, for me, is the hardest part of compliance with the GDPR, but also the most important thing to get right as well. OK, so that's a great one. One of the requirements or one of the expectations of GDPR is that you know what data you have and you know how you're using it. Um, so data inventories, data flow maps, data audits, um, those are absolutely critical under GDPR. And not for one second should we think that that's a small job because in most complex organizations, there are many places in which data is coming in, many ways in which it's being used. Um, Alex, what was the most vexing, most challenging implementation problem that you had at Accenture? Actually, the most challenging thing we have seen is definitely that um, it's a new law. At the time, we were looking into the law, which we started the project very early, so two years ago. Um, there was nothing out there to give us any guidance on it. So we really had to interpret the law in the way um, it would work for us. Actually, um, that was initially a huge challenge. Um, guidance came out <coughs> dropping in later, right? Very late yeah. to some of the point. And um, so we leveraged that. On the other side, it also gives a bit of a reflection on what is required under GDPR as part of the accountability you have. You are also required to interpret the laws and the rules, how it would make sense for you as a company. And um, at one point, we really then were taking the step forward and saying like, OK, we need to decide how we are interpreting it. And that's the way we are doing it. We so this is, uh, this is a really interesting point. GDPR is a new regulation. It just went to, into effect um, on May 25th. It was passed, introduced just two years ago. And the regulators in Europe and the courts have not had a chance to interpret it. Exactly. And I think it's fair to say that there's many provisions within GDPR that are less than clear. There are many questions that remain unanswered. How do you manage that risk inside Accenture? How do you make those decisions? What, what, is the, what are the tools that you use to try to answer some of those questions? Yeah. We actually implemented and enhanced a couple of tools for managing our data privacy compliance. And one of the major, actually, um, not really changes, but improvements we did is that we implemented a lot of data privacy controls. We um, actually had a lot of security controls beforehand, but now we leveraged um, the systems for the security controls to enhance them with new privacy controls, which actually required us to work closely, obviously, with our security people and to understand where we have potentially overlaps, but also actually um, to implement those new tools. On the other side, we implemented uh, data privacy impact assessment tools, um, another new tool, and given um, the requirement of the regulations that you need to document what you are assessing, um, we really wanted to have it in a very specific place, and we wanted to use a very specific tool for it. And um, this actually took a bit of a while to define what are the requirements of the tools, um, which would be the right provider of the tool, could we do it ourselves or not, and then we moved on. The third tool we implemented, and one of the biggest tools, and actually um, also reflecting a bit that GDPR can be also an enhancer, was our um, supplier tool. 
So we had certain supplier tools and applications for our procurement um, uh, team, um, so global uh, procurement, um, but um, with now all the supplier requirements we do have for um, applying due diligence on the suppliers, really understand and know which supplier is touching which data, if you want to say so. Um, so that actually required us, us also, also taking into account the size of the suppliers we have mm. and the number um, that uh, we implemented a new supplier tool and also leveraged that for our supplier due diligence. Excellent. So, so three really powerful tools. Yes. First, you borrowed from your information security um, colleagues and yes. used their risk controls, which is powerful. You implemented data protection impact assessments, uh, a risk management tool where you are assessing the data protection consequences in new products, new features, new ideas inside your organization. And third, Consistent with what we were discussing with uh, data processor agreements, you implemented a supplier tool. Um, many are talking about GDPR ushering in a new era of digital supply chain management, and it sounds like that's very close to that. Hillary, tell me about technological tools and how important they are in a GDPR response. Um, organizations clearly are investing in these tools. Uh, we certainly see many more vendors emerging in the marketplace. Your company, TrustArc, is one of the leading players in the space. Tell us about that part of the solution. Yeah, so one of the things that we're seeing, and it, it, I'm going to go back to the data that we talked about right at the beginning of our session today, is that um, people are not fully ready to comply, and even those who have um, claimed that they are compliant need to manage their ongoing obligations with respect to GDPR. And as um, my colleagues have shared already, it's important to understand what's happening with your data, where it's flowing, and how that changes over time. So what we're seeing in terms of technology is a need and a growing um, need for many organizations to understand what's happening with their data. So they're employing more data discovery tools for privacy purposes and really partnering with their information security colleagues to make sure that they're understanding what's happening with the data more effectively. Um, downstream from that, we're seeing that they are beginning to use data inventory or data mapping tools. And so, by way of contrast to some of the tools that have been used before to do an asset inventory, the data inventory tools for privacy purposes are ones that are looking more into how exactly are you using the data? Um, as my colleagues have shared already, it's important in order to comply with GDPR that you know what is the data being used for. It's a concept called processing purposes. And so we have these data inventory tools that are helping to understand what are the processing purposes and help to better understand as the data are flowing throughout the um, actual data flow from, a, uh, organization, from a an individual from whom they're collected to an organization, to a processor, to another supplier, to a hosting provider, to recipients, exactly what is happening with that data as it's traveling around the world. From there, we're also seeing that organizations, as Alex was saying, are needing to assess. And they're needing to assess various different things, very similar to what happens with data um, assessments from a security perspective, so assessing suppliers, um, but not just for security controls, but also for privacy-related controls, as Alex was sharing. Um, lastly, I'll say, in terms of the things we're seeing the greatest uptake in are tools around understanding risk. And I say, um, I, I share that at the outset because security risk, I think there's been a lot of work done to understand and define what security risk management or information risk management looks like um, to address information security obligations within organizations. What we see under GDPR that's particularly troubling, given that there's not a ton of guidance out there yet, is that there's an obligation for organizations to understand and protect something called the risks to the rights and freedoms of individuals. That's not an objective thing. 
That is a very subjective determination. And so what the tools are beginning to do is to help organizations define objectively what does that risk actually look like? What kind of data may be sensitive that may be causing some harms to individuals? What kind of processing involves monitoring or surveillance, for an example, as something that's perceived by the regulators to be higher risk? And I could list a number of other things, but those are the main tools that we're beginning to see as part of the research that we've done together with the IAPP. Fantastic. So we've kind of covered the operational response to GDPR, and as we go through the list, the inventory of new tools, new ideas, new uh, processes that have emerged inside organizations to comply with GDPR, I'm struck by one thing. We've talked about um, data inventory. We've talked about data flow mapping. We've talked about strong vendor and supplier and partner controls. We've talked about data, um, um, data protection impact assessments. We didn't mention uh, data subject access requests, which is another major tool um, or another requirement under GDPR. What I'm struck by is how much these look like presence to the information security field. You know, these are good data management tools, yeah. and I think any information security pro um, should be delighted to see investment and resources coming into these types of tools. Um, in many ways, all the people in this audience should go back and buy a drink or give a present to their chief privacy officer or their data protection officer back in their home office, because I think there really is some synergy here. All right, let's move on and talk about the global perspective. And Tharishni, I'm hoping that you can give us a sense. What has the response been in the Asian marketplace? You're responsible for Asia Pacific, for Aeon. What type of engagement, what type of receptiveness have you seen market to market across the Asia Pacific region? And, um, and where do you see that going? Sure. So I think there is a couple of, like, there are very different countries in how they look at privacy and data protection within the region. Um, I guess the big one would be Japan, that very recently the EU said we'll look at giving them an adequacy status. Right. So an adequacy status means that particular country has the same amount of protection or the same level of protection for individual data as it would be in the EU. But recent statistics, so EY conducted um, a survey that only a quarter of Japanese companies surveyed said they had made progress. 20% uh, plan to do so. I don't think planning to do something would fly with the regulator very much. 26% uh, updated their privacy statements online. Again, while that's a publicly facing thing and you think you're covering that risk, there's so much more to be done. But what I find really interesting in this survey is that only 7% of organizations are prepared for the 72-hour breach notification mm -hmm. requirement. And that is honestly a big key piece when you talk about risk and exposure when it comes to a data breach. You need to inform a regulator within 72 hours. And if you're not prepared for that, you're looking at very large numbers of fines, which, which I understand Trevor will go to later. Um, and in other markets in Asia, I think when you look at the companies that are operating on a global level, the level of awareness is there. Um, and in fact, it's almost taken precedent over the local laws and regulations that exist mm. for data privacy, such as the PDPA. I've seen that happen in some organizations where with contracts, they say EU law, um, the GDPR, but not necessarily the law that of the land. So that's an interesting um, mm. development. And in some countries as well, you see the fact that GDPR is there. It's bringing attention to local legislation, that there is an existence almost side by side of local privacy legislation and data protection laws and the GDPR. So there's a lot of positivity there, but still a lack of, I think, knowledge um, and also attention to the details that are involved in the GDPR because it's a large document. Uh, mm. I think we might have all read it, but not a lot of people would go to that level. And I think that's really where the regulators need to come in and provide so, guidance. Um, it sounds like there's a lot of work still to be done. Um, right. And Alex, I, I, I'm going to ask you a rhetorical question. So it sounds like uh, along with French wine and German automobiles, the GDPR might be one of the greatest exports ever from <laughs> Europe, is that fair? Um, all right, let's turn now to enforcement. So I'm gonna read a couple of quotes for you here. 
The first is, uh, the aim of our office is to prevent harm, but we will back that up with tough action where necessary. Any guesses? ICO. Well done, our first correct answer. Well done, well done, Alex. Uh, that is Liz Denham, the uh, information commissioner from the UK. Now, notably, Liz Denham just brought an enforcement action and issued a fine, or proposed a fine, against Facebook for the Cambridge Analytica um, issue, and that was 500,000 pounds. But that was a fine brought under the prior regime, which was the data protection directive, and that was the maximum fine. Under GDPR, maximum fines go up to 4% of global turnover, which is to say 4% of global revenue for an organization. Had the fine been the maximum fine under GDPR in this Facebook example, it theoretically could have been many billions of dollars, mm -hmm. um, which is really quite striking. Um, let me offer another quote. There will be fines, and they will be significant. Any guesses? That was Helen Dixon, the oh, Irish Data like Protection Helen. Commissioner. And uh, notably, Helen Dixon um, oversees Ireland, the jurisdiction where many of the major tech players have their European headquarters. So she will be the regulator of record. So let's talk about fines. Is GDPR really all about the fines? Is that the thing that we should be responding to the most? That this is a risk management response, that we're trying to avoid fines, and so the, the big stick of 4% of global turnover, that's what CEOs and boards of directors are mostly going to pay attention to, and that's why we should comply with GDPR. Alex, is that the right answer? Um. I don't think so. However, the 4% definitely helps in yeah. getting the attention and awareness of your CEO and to honestly also open the kind of pockets for bigger budgets and for more resources. At least um, it definitely helped awareness within our company. And uh, on the other side, I have to say, just looking at the fines, it will not ever help you because um, GDPR is much more about um, how you are able as a company to handle personal data in, an, in a responsible way. And I think, especially in the, the area we are working in, and this is digital, it is hugely important for us to do it in a very responsible way and also be trusted by our clients, but as well by our employees, that we handle the, the data in the way we not only should do, but it's also the right thing to do. And therefore, GDPR, obviously, for the privacy team, was a big advantage because now we had the money and the resources to more invest. Actually, we didn't get all of what we would have asked for, but um, at least it helped a bit. But um, yeah, the, the intention really needs to go much beyond the 4% as, um, as a stick here. So the 4% fines will capture one's attention. They will open the door to a conversation um, and perhaps allow some resources to be loosened up and created right. within the organization, but they're not the end of the story. Hillary, you spend a lot of time in Europe. What do you think we should be expecting from the regulators with regards to enforcement? So Helen Dixon said, well, there will be fines and they will be significant. Liz Denham said the aim of her office is to prevent harm, but they'll back that up with tough action. So the regulators are putting forward some language that suggests that they're going to use fines. So I think we should expect enforcement. What do you think that's going to look like? Well, I think first it's going to look like regulators responding to the complaints that they are already receiving from data subjects or individuals about whom the data are processed. We know from what they've shared that they are getting many more complaints than they have received historically. In fact, many of them have in the thousands of complaints that they're dealing with right now. Um, what do I think it will look like as a result? I think that it will force organizations to be able to show how they have put in place 
place measures to comply with these various different operational requirements that we've been discussing on the panel today. How you can show that you actually have maintained a record of what your data processing looked like, how you've done your assessments, how you've managed you know, incident management processes within your organization to actually show that you're prepared to respond timely and to report to them if you've had a breach. They'll be looking to see whether or not you've managed any breaches that have happened in accordance with their expectations. One of which is, as we were talking about risk earlier, to actually evaluate what your risk is associated with that breach consistent with the expectations under GDPR. So I think early on, they're going to be looking for demonstration of preparedness that you haven't, as Thrishni said, ignored completely or done nothing yet, but that you've put these requirements into place within your organiza the organization that you're prepared to respond. I think ultimately, though, they will be looking to see how well you've managed the risk associated with that data, and if you've not taken that seriously, um, that you will not have any mitigating measures um, when it comes to these stiff fines that they have the ability now to to um, put in place. I think that's really well said. And, and let me just capture that point for this audience. One of the things that we have heard consistently from regulators with regards to these fines is that good faith will go a long way. And that means if you show the good faith in assessing the risk, in interpreting the GDPR to the best of your abilities, and you do the hard work, that that will be a significant mitigating factor in any enforcement action that a regulator may bring or any complaint that may come towards you. Um, but doing that hard work, I think, is pretty critical. Um, Tarishni, tell me about that hard work at Aon. Tell me about how, um, how you have implemented resources across Aon and, and where you see the greatest work in the, in the weeks and months ahead. Sure. Um, one thing to mention is within Aon, the GDPR compliance program is actually sponsored not by the privacy team, but by the global security services. Wow. So, that, so this went all the way up to our CISO, uh, and they're the sponsors of the program, understanding that a huge part of GDPR compliance rests within security and our inf information security professionals, because they ultimately understand how the business works, um, and if, you know, what, we can advise on the legal perspectives, but from an operational, practical perspective, it is the security professionals that understand how to actually operationalize that. So the cooperation between the privacy team and the global security services at Aon has been honestly one of the most helpful ways that this program has moved forward. And so in terms of the next few months, we're looking at also, we've also called it phase two, because a lot of the stuff in phase one was just around notifications, consents, contracts. Now is actually how do we deal with a major attack or a major incident that happens within your, our organization? With data flowing from various different countries and continents, how do we then address a particular incident within 72 hours? And the hard work is not just with the core team that's working on it. So we, we are planning on having sort of tabletop exercises. Um, we've, you know, we've had sort of fake phishing attacks that were engineered by our guys, um, you know, and seeing really it's not about um, whether people fall for it, but where the percentages of people falling for that. Did they actually report the fact that they were fish to the correct um, entity within Aon, for example. These are the hard work we need to do because if the numbers are not great, we need to get it to great. Um, every employee needs to know their responsibility to respond to an incident really quickly because those 72 hours pass by very, very quickly. And in contracts itself, if we are a vendor, it's not going to be 72 hours. Um, the data user will say, come back to me in 24 hours upon discovery. And as a vendor of a lot of major organizations, this is something that is a responsibility for every single employee. And that's really wow. the hard work. Yeah. Wow. All right, we're heading towards the end of our time. And I want to talk about the future and future risk and future complexity uh, because the data protection world does not live in stasis. It actually moves quite quickly. There's a number of things emerging on the horizon that could add even more complexity to what we already experience in our world. So, um, Alex, why don't we start with you? I'd like to go down the panel and just tell me what you are thinking about now and preparing for or worried about 
um, that might be coming up in the next year or two years? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, GDPR is a good, good baseline, as we put it. Um, but um, as we are a digital company, we are looking very much in new technologies. It's, um, it's providing actually also some um, new answers, I should say, to some of the challenges the new technologies are bringing with them. So like um, IoT, how, how we are dealing with that. Um, are we um, thinking about machine learning? blockchain, these are answers we are looking into. Obviously, we now need to look into it uh, from a GDPR perspective, but we also want to find answers to it um, from, from our perspective, how we are interpreting it and how we are giving it. And um, yeah, maybe not only one, one legal framework um, answer here, but really an ethical answer mm. to how we manage personal data with those new technologies. So one of your concerns would be sort of like the 1995 directive could not contemplate smartphones and the internet and social media, GDPR may not be fully formed to contemplate IoT and facial recognition and AI and other things. Great, Tharishni. I think working in an insurance company really um, is to my benefit, because the, if you can insure a risk, they'll find it. Yep. Um, and the, so that's been pretty cool. And so I think one of the things you were talking about, new technologies, um, and whether the privacy laws really do help with that. Because under GDPR, one of the concerns is monitoring uh, behavior of individuals. At what point does this law start and stop when it comes to innovation? I think that's really been a big, I think that's a big future challenge for any organization. Um, you want to use data to innovate. Can the privacy laws keep up? Can we ensure that these privacy rules are evergreen as well, that these are the principles that we can rely on to ensure that um, innovation is there, but also individual rights, because people tend to forget about the people behind the scenes. Mm. So one of the reasons I like privacy laws, it is focused on preserving individual rights. Fantastic. Hillary. The thing I'm most worried about, actually, is one we haven't spent time talking about, and that is the restriction um, under GDPR on cross-border data flow mm -hmm. and the limited mechanisms that exist right now to actually make that happen, many of which actually are under threat um, as potentially not being vehicles that can be used in the future. So currently there are means by which people move data lawfully using contracts, the standard contracts that have been approved by the European Commission are actually um, currently uh, being challenged as to their validity, and so there may not be a standard anymore. In the absence of a standard, one individual company needs to go to a regulator and get approval for each form of agreement that they need. Imagine how much that will slow data flows. And so I worry about whether there will be vehicles such as GDPR certification or codes of conduct or other forms of framework mechanisms that will allow data to flow around the globe the way it needs to in order to drive the digital economy. I, I think that's a great one and I'll add to that mix um, Brexit. So um, uh, Hillary is absolutely right to raise the issue of data transfers under GDPR. You cannot transfer data outside of the European Union unless you have a mechanism for transferring data outside of the European Union. Um, those data transfers are going to get much more complex um, after Brexit. Okay, we are in the speed round of our panel. Um, we have an audience of incredibly engaged information security professionals here with us. Uh, from your perspective as a data protection expert, what is the most important thing that these information security professionals should take back to their office? Alex? Yes. Um, actually, data privacy is um, going hand in hand with information security. We actually did something very similar, what happened at Aeon. Um, we partnered with our information security team and um, built our enhanced data privacy program in or within the framework of information security. We now have implemented a team of 15 data privacy and information security leads. That's actually how they are called. And you see from the title or name that they are not only doing data privacy, but also information security, because we are big believing that you can't actually detangle that without a good course. So um, there is this um, idea that whenever you have data, 
personal data, you need to have security around this, and security is the dependency on how privacy programs run. So coming together or getting together both angles um, are actually hugely helpful, and therefore I think um, all security people should have regular conversation with the privacy people at Excellent. the company. Tarishni. I would just add on to that to say it's about speaking a common language. I think okay. in the past, um, you know, the legal department and security and technology didn't speak a common language. And the GDPR allows for that kind of conversation to happen. A security professional should know some of the intricacies of GDPR and how it affects their job, and so with the, does the legal department. Um, I think a couple of days ago I spoke about the legal department understanding terms in cyber security and cyber attacks, the different types of cyber attacks that exist. And so coming together and speaking the same language is hopefully the takeaway from the GDPR. Excellent. Hillary. And I will just echo what they're saying through the words integrated data governance and risk management. Excellent. I will add my point that I think this group should take away, and that is that the privacy professionals, the data protection professionals in your organization are your colleagues in arms. They are your partners in managing this incredibly complex digital economy. I'll tell you, one of the things that gives me great hope for our future in data protection in the digital economy is the strength and wisdom of leaders like this. So I hope you'll join me in thanking our panelists for a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.